leaders. We hear a lot in our hero-obsessed culture about leadership. We quest for it at the box office and in our own office. A clear vision, a strong focus, a guiding force through the chaos. But the examples we have of true leadership in real life, especially when it comes to business, portray leadership as a jumbled mess of conflicting characteristics. Is a leader someone who talks in public just once a year on a big stage, or someone who raises their voice constantly on Twitter? Is a true leader bold, brash, big, and brazen? Or quiet, considered, and contemplative? Does a leader say what they mean? Are they mean when they say it? Do they take the reins? Do they make it rain? Do they toe the line or do they cross it? It seems in a way that we view leadership as an inhuman feat in our culture, something we mortals need coaches, camps, seminars, and boot camps to acquire. True leadership seems like something reserved for actual heroes, a byproduct of a mutation or an asteroid collision, some freak occurrence of confidence that causes some fearless person to rise above us and glow and float and lead. But what if that wasn't the case? What if being a leader was less about raw strength and power and more about emotional intelligence? What if leading the way forward was less about you and more about us? That's what we're talking about today on Lawsome. Leadership, what it means and how to bring it to your law firm in a meaningful way. You ready to follow us on this journey? Well, let's go. Lawsome the podcast for law firms, powered by ConsultWebs. Welcome back to Lawson, the only podcast for law firms that cross-examines its breakfast. We're here to inform, educate, and entertain the legal community on the latest in personal and professional development. I am health nut and vegan marketing guru, Jake Sanders. And with me is the falafel king, the PPC hero himself, Paul Julius. Paul, I saw you spinning in that window with those hot lights on your meaty goodness. Yeah, it ain't nothing vegan over here, baby. That's 100%. <laughs> whatever, Just, whatever that meat is. <laughs> cage free. <laughs> Don't think about it too much. I'm not, I can't stop That's thinking about it. That's why you're vegan, it. right? I thought Ugh. about the gyro and it just, I don't know, man. Yeah, I gotta go. I gotta go eat some cashew cheese or something and just ease, ease like- into this. Fine, you do it. All right, um, let's fold into a pita pocket and tell people what's in store today. All right, here's what we got. On the show today, we talk about law firm leadership, and then we discuss emotional intelligence, leadership, and business development for law firms with Natalie and Gordon Loeb from Loeb Leadership. And then we throw our guests to the wolves with five questions we ask everyone. Pull up a plate. It's the Hot Takes Buffet. The Hot Take Today is by Josh Kalish on lawpracticetoday.org from the ABA. It's entitled, Law Firm Leadership, Lead, Follow, or Get Out of the Way. The top quote is, uh, law firms need leadership, and not everyone at the firm is going to contribute. <laughs> Good. <laughs> it's just like everybody's leading. It's, it's insane. I don't know who to follow. Um, but every successful law firm needs inspiring leadership to be the voice of the vision and guide others to move forward into an uncertain future. Paul, yo, what do you think about this in regards to, it's funny because as I was writing this down in the show notes, you were kind of like, oh, that, that Natalie says that Gordon says that this is exactly what we say in the interview. So it's, it's awesome when we find an article that aligns so well with the interview. What, what did you think of this? Yeah, absolutely. There was so much in here. I'm so glad you found this article because there's a lot in here that we talk about and we actually I I think I asked him what's the difference between a, a manager and a yeah, leader. Yeah, I know that um, was unprompted, and, and that's the first part here in this is that you got to figure out. No, I, it, most people say you're a great manager, you'd be a great leader, and that's not the case. I that didn't strike it in my mind. I mean, when you were you were in a leadership role and a manager role, I mean, like w- speak to it really quickly. What's the difference? I uh, they both suck. Or <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> It's a different thing. I, I think I think a lot of it has to do with responsibilities um, and your willingness to kind of to shoulder some of that stuff. Hmm. I, I thought a really great part of the interview was when we talked about empathy. Hmm. To be a manager, you have to have a certain level of empathy. Uh, I think to be a leader, you have to have a, a different kind of empathy. Interesting. Um, and and they Gordon really goes into it pretty well. I think that's kind of the thing because um, 
you know, there's a, there's a different level of accountability for a manager. Um, and, and there's a lot of like execution type stuff, mm-hmm. whereas leadership, it seems like there's a little bit more, um, interpretation and, um, you know, guidance, uh, mm-hmm. making sure that, that, um, in, in the larger sense, not only are the managers doing what they're doing, but they're doing it the right way that people are getting treated the right way, both mm. internal and external. So, mm. um, there's, there's a lot to it. I, one thing that really stood out with me with this article though, um, and, and you brought it up and, and I think we, we kind of skirted around it, but I'm, I'm curious mm-hmm. what you think about this. It says benchmarking other businesses. Mm-hmm. I don't know that law firms do that as often as they should. And and I thought it was very interesting that Natalie and Gordon brought this up. Um, Michelle Stefano also brought it up to a certain extent too, mm-hmm. that law firms don't really look outside of legal and they should, you know? Well, and, and it's, and it's only because for going on down in, in this article on law practice today, it's, you have to think of your law firm as a business from the from a, an essential point which includes the identification of managers and leaders and then that would help you say well how do other people handle this situation cuz it's complex but you don't want to add more complication on top of it and that's why i think it's interesting that you were bringing up the difference that leaders need to be more strategic but managers need to be more strategically aware and it's just subtle little differences that if you look outside, how, how do how, so? You know, equity partners in law firms need to recognize that they're business owners. So you know, it's like you have to think of client satisfaction, then you have to think of organizational psychology and how people work together, um, and then you have to develop leadership characteristics in everybody. You know, so it's it's hard because there's multiple points to it and it's not just a clearly defined role um that's why i think if you if you're stuck looking at just other law firms you might miss the way um just like michelle was talking about you know um just like autumn Whit boyd was talking about just like aaron levine uh has discussed on this show lawyers who looked outside of law firms to develop their business plans um accordingly that's why you just have to think of it as a business essentially, and then you can start, you know, finding ways to change it. But in our interview, we find the true leaders aren't just doing it with smarts. They're not emotional. They're, they're not, they're not just doing it with their IQ. They're doing it with EQ. <clears throat> and there's a I lot of, that. they start bringing emotions into it. And, um, because you have to be aware and um, ask those questions because it ends up being, are, are you comfortable having these questions asked? You know, are you ready to develop as a business? You know, and that's why a lot of people say, man, I just got a law degree to be a lawyer. So they close this reality off when in, re- in, in truth, this is a really powerful um, thing to be aware of. And it actually helps you develop your business if you think of it as such. So just really from a small semantic you know frame of reference um oh yeah but the real success comes from people who are using their emotions you know so um i i I think that's at least i think they say they they can can recognize that i think that's part of it like that's a big thing is before you can use it you have to identify that's you know exactly kind of what's going on with that Yeah. Um, yeah but it's it's yeah that's for real man yeah and and so so let's we'll we'll go to the interview um but I'll end with a quote from Josh's article on lawpracticetoday.org. You guys should check it out. Um, so what how how are we gonna how are we gonna create leaders in law firms? And and this is how he ends it. He says, Today's law firm leaders get to decide how they develop, shape, and socialize their vision to attorneys who are working heads down on cases, as well as their openness for input into the vision and ultimately whether to weed out those that are not fully aligned with the firm's vision. It's a choice. So lead, follow, or get out of the way. Lawson continues. But first, a word from our sponsor. Any lawyer looking to grow their business online can generate more leads from their website by hiring ConsultWebs. After working with lawyers exclusively since 1999, we've tested thousands of web designs and marketing strategies, so we know what flips and what flops. 
For more information, visit www.consultwebs.com today. And now, a Lawsome interview. Natalie and Gordon Loeb have been at the heart of legal leadership development for over 20 years and have crystallized their experiences into Loeb Leadership, a law firm development agency that creates extraordinary leaders which positively impact morale, productivity, and profit. Prior to founding Loeb Leadership, Natalie was in charge of organizational development solutions at Skadden, Arps, Slate, Marr, and Flom, and Gordon worked in several corporate and entrepreneurial roles before growing Loeb Leadership into what it is today. And now, their careers take a stunning turn with an appearance on the Lawson Podcast. Natalie Gordon, thanks for being here. Woo-hoo. Thanks for having us. We're very excited to be here. Yes. The first woo. I'm excited. Um, so well, let, let's talk about Loeb Leadership, what you guys are doing over there, what's your backstory with law firms and leaders, and where are you at today? Yeah. Well, do I start? You can start. Okay, I'll start. Yeah. So I love telling this story. Um, so I'll, I'll go ahead and begin. And of course, you know, cut me off or shorten me if, if it seems a little long, but <laughs> sure. I'll, I'll try, try and do it at, at a reasonable pace. All right. Um, so the story of, of Love Leadership. So I, I actually like to start at the beginning when I always say, if you asked my parents what I was like as a kid, they'll tell you that I was always the person that seemed to form a lot of relationships and just sort of knew what people needed at what time. Um, it's just sort of who I am and it's in my DNA. So I studied psychology in undergraduate in college. My last semester, senior year, while I was in college, I wasn't sure what to do with psychology. I didn't want to be a therapist, a psychologist, a psychiatrist. I was always fascinated by business. I always wondered about how you put people of different backgrounds, different um, different personalities together within an organization, you know, mm-hmm. where there is some pressure mm-hmm. and expect that things would go seamlessly and everyone would just organically get along. It just yeah, right. seemed difficult to me. Right. So the last semester, senior year in college, of course, came on the curriculum called Industrial Organizational Psychology. I took that class and I said, bingo, that's exactly what I want to do. Mm. So I tell you that story only because in terms of our business, people get to our business in a number of ways. This business has really grown from an initial passion for helping people to be effective in the workplace. So I went back to New York City after I graduated from school and I did my graduate work at Baruch College in New York City. Mm. And um, while I was doing that graduate work, I realized I need to be in human resources. And Mm. I went looking for a job in human resources. I ended up at Skadden Arps, Slate Mar and Flom in New York City. Um, I was very fortunate to uh, get, get an interview there. And when I got there, I really didn't know what big law was, but I interviewed with an excellent HR manager and an excellent director of HR. They offered me a job in the on the human resources team. Mm. Uh, mm. My The idea was to expose me to different areas of human resources, such as recruiting and compensation and um uh, employee relations and what have you. They happened to have a director of HR at the time that had done the same graduate program that I had in industrial organizational psychology. So this director had an understanding of, of valuing people development. And so when she saw I was studying the same program, they put me in training and development at the time, is that what they called it? And they allowed me to take the ball and run with it. So my job initially was to find other consultants to come in and work with the managers of the firm on the staff side and help build and develop their leadership skills. Uh, Since I was studying it, I said, can I do it? So this director, of course, said, go with it. That was sort of the whole uh, culture at Skadden, which I'll always still appreciate to this day. And so what happened was I was able to speak to managers and do needs assessments. I was able to design and deliver um, training programs to managers and staff at all levels. I was able to go out and get myself certified in a variety of programs and bring them back to the firm and deliver them. And so eventually what that grew into was an in-house training university at the firm, which is still there to this day and is still beautifully constantly updated and managed within the firm. So um, doing that for 10 years at Skadden obviously gave me a lot of insight into what it was like to work at Big Law. The only reason I left for me was a work-life decision. So we, we talked earlier a little bit about moms. You know, I, certainly I was a working mom. I still am, although we're, today we're empty nesters. Um, but I had to figure out when I, I moved to about two hours away from the firm and the round trip commute was about four. I actually left the firm, found a job closer to home. Mm-hmm. About a couple of weeks later, I got a call from the person who was then head of HR. It was somebody different and said, you know, we were thinking about this. Perhaps we could um, put you on as a uh, change your status to a consulting status bring you back so you could work at home and just come in and continue to do the training and development for the firm, um, for the managers of the firm. 
I was actually, I know that was worked perfectly in my schedule. I was honored, privileged, and thrilled to be able to do that. So um, I always say that sort of Skadden helped to launch what I would say is my cons- was my consulting career. So I'll fast forward now. That was 21 years ago. Once you start consulting, um, people move to other firms, other consulting firms, sort of you, you live, swim in the same seas, if you will, and they start to ask you to do work for them. So I started doing a lot of designing and delivering for a number of law firms, as well as other organizations, as, um, as people would move to other organizations, which I always found fascinating and interesting to see what other organizations were, do, were doing and grabbing some of those best practices and bringing them back into our law firms, which we still do today. Um, I will also say 21 years later, I'm really proud to say we're a certified woman-owned business. My husband and I, who will speak in a moment. Um, time. Yes, we'll give him some. <laughs> uh, believe me, I'll, I'm almost done with my story, but <laughs> he, um, that's part of how we work. Um, he was always supporting me uh, on, on, you know, in terms of uh, some of the operations work while he had his full-time job. Uh, about eight years ago, we made a decision to make this a family business because work was growing. We hired our own business coach who put us through some assessments to make sure that we could succeed both as being married as well as business partners. That's a whole other story. Oh, but yeah. the good news is the coach did say, although 80% of all family businesses fail within the first three years, that you two are designed to make this work. And since Gordon and I have been working together, Gordon full time, the business has launched exponentially. So I think there's some truth to that. Today, um, Gordon and I lead the business. We're both trained coaches. We do leadership coaching ourselves at times. And we also launch and do retreat work and also help to launch programs when, when the client wants us to. But we have a bench of about 40 now coaches, uh, facilitators, and organizational development specialists that work with us on our team. And so when we're working with clients, we have um, you know, people to bring in as resources to meet whatever needs they may be. So I'll stop there and, and pause and breathe for a moment uh, and just see you know, if there's any reaction or sort of that helps to tell you a little bit about who we are. No, I think it's amazing. So, um, so, so Gordon's role is sort of reaching out, um, developing sort of the connections that are expanding Loeb leadership. Gordon, I mean, like kind of, uh, what, what's it been like, uh, taking all of this expertise and, and bringing it to other law firms? Sure. I appreciate that. Um, so the role has actually morphed over time and one of the things that, that um, we have brought into our picture are business development specialists and strategic partnership uh, directors. So now my, my jobs are really to go out and to talk to a lot of the law firms to really find out what they're looking for, what they're trying to do. Uh, when we first started our business, it was mostly, um, you know, can you do this one training session for us? Can you do something on presentation skills? And now since we have over, four, over 40 coaches and consultants, uh, both domestically and globally, it's more along the lines of, you know, we're, we're having some issues with our culture and we want to do something around that. We, here's where we are today and we want to really get to hear what can you guys do for us? Um, what has worked with uh, at other law firms that we might be able to bring in here? Law firms tend to like to work with resources that are proven at other law firms. So one of the first questions that we get asked uh, is basically what other firms ha- are you working at? And we're you know, lucky enough to say that we work at, with a, most of the AMLA 100 and 200 firms. We have quite a vast experience of, of working with firms. And as Natalie mentioned, about 35% of our business comes from outside of legal. Uh, and we do that on purpose because we want to bring in a lot of best practices into the world of law firms. Law firms, when it comes to leadership and management development, sometimes don't have the best practices. So we're able to bring in some things that really can shake things up. Uh, law firms have taken a longer time to adapt to a lot of the changes that have been facing them and the disruption. But we're seeing a really, really strong investment in people, in the talent at the firms, both on the attorney side and also on the business services and administrative side. So we're very, very uh, pleased to see that there's a major uptick in bringing in uh, coaches or having internal coaches work with some of the high potential and high achievers within the firms. And firms are taking a look at, you know, what their environment looks like, you know, how engaged are their folks? Um, what kind of uh, career path is there? Is it clearly outlined or is it murky and, uh, and people are potentially losing interest? You know, how can they develop their folks more? And how can they make sure that their people realize that the firm wants to make sure that their people do get development and do grow within mm. the firm? Yeah. You know, it's, it's so interesting because it seems like the core of the whole, um, you know, trajectory of, you know, Natalie's work doing organizational development, human resources, um, and then your work 
doing needs assessment with clients is is asking questions. Like all you guys do is really just dig into questions. And I think that sparks the either negative or positive response that 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 certain leaders or law firm owners might have in regards to these things. And I see that like if you work with somebody else, then maybe I can um, you know, accept you into my circle of trust. But I think there's something about uh ego and leadership and and people who are willing to ask those questions or be asked those questions and maybe not have answers. Um so I but it feels like the responsibility of leadership to to really lead is on like one person. And then that might cause an ego to sort of run the show. And then it's like, well, I know how to be innovative here, or I'm the leader. Um, how do you guys sort of uh, dig into the kind of sensitive nature of those questions that you have to have answers to, yeah. to create the leaders? Um, how do you deal with ego and leadership, you know, at low leadership? That is such a great question. And as you, actually, as you were formulating it, there were so many things already going through my head. Mm -hmm. So for example, as, as we, I, as I mentioned, when I started my um, career, I was um, focused on working with the administrative staff. And as the business grew and people saw the impact of our work, and that was mostly at Skadden, um, and then we'd bring it to other firms, we'd have people in leadership positions saying, hey, can you do some of this work with our lawyers? And of course, that was a place we, we were, we are, and we were, right? We were eager to go. And so, um, and having, of course, worked in law firms, you know, kind of had a sense of exactly what you were talking about. Mm -hmm. So here's what I'll, I'll share a couple of things that I found really interesting. As we started to uh, go over the bridge and start working on the legal side, there were certainly um, those moments where we knew that in order to be, quote, accepted or even... Um, it be thought of that we were, it was a, a good use of time. Mm. Um, we had to, we had to be able to show our competence around what we do and what we do and what we model is, and what we try really hard to model is it, it, even in our initial conversations is what great leadership looks like. I'll give you an example of, mm -hmm. of a story. Um, I will never forget when there was one firm that we were working with early on we were, he knew we were there to talk about leadership and I was warned ahead of time that this partner could be a bit ornery. Mm. And as we, we were introduced and starting the conversation, he said to me, so, so how do you define leadership anyway? What is this leadership? So I said, and I just had a pull right from, you know, the knowledge that we have. I said, here's what I think great leaders do. They model the way. They demonstrate the behaviors that they want to see of others and they hold themselves accountable for that. And they're authentic when they do it. They inspire a shared vision. They're very clear on the direction of where they wanna take folks and they're able to inspire people to follow them, not push them along. So that when they're out there, people are actually following because if they turn around and no one's looking behind them, they're really just taking a walk. They like to challenge the status quo. They like to take a look at things and see what we can do better. How can we improve? They like to uh, strengthen and foster the performance of others. And they like to provide recognition and make sure when people are doing a good job that they show that they appreciate it. That's what I think great leaders do. I said, how would you describe it? And he goes, just like that. So in other words, I think there we were getting tested on What's leadership? And we had to be able to come back and say, look, we get this leadership stuff. We know what it is. We live it. We do it. We talk about it. And then that was able to open us up to, can we ask you a couple of questions? One of the questions I like to ask, and sometimes it stumps some of the folks that we talk to is, tell me about a great leader here. Who's somebody that you have always looked up to? Because you would say that's somebody that you would always follow. Wow. I'll tell you something, right. You know right there. Because sometimes they'll go, Huh. And, you know, when they're struggling for that, that gives a little insight. Sometimes you'll get, well, yeah, let me tell you about so-and-so. And that's where we begin to be, uh, understand a little bit of what the culture of that firm may be like. Man, well, it just right there, I started to feel like if I say somebody and they're not my friend or 
or, oh, you're not my, or, or like, it's a whole ego. Like, it's like you're running for high school president or something. Like, it's not about leaders. It's like, well, who can I out right now or not? <laughs> you know, yeah, I, it's, 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 it's interesting you respond like that. Uh, you know, what we find is when we set it up and they understand that what we do and how, when people are um, more sophisticated in, in what leadership is, that they get interested and intrigued. The beautiful thing about lawyers is that they're really smart. And once they are intrigued about what this stuff is, they will really, we found, gravitate towards it. There was a thing before with modeling the way and inspiring and so on. Um, Those are what we call the five practices of exemplary leadership. It's based on the leadership challenge by Kuzis and Posner. And there are lots of different leadership models out there. That's one of the ones that we utilized a lot when we do in-house training and development. But the bottom line is, in a lot of professional services firms, like law firms and, and other types of professional service industries, many people focus on their IQ to get to the levels that they are and to they believe that that's what's really important to get to the next levels. What we find uh, through all of the work that we do and a lot of the research out there is that your EQ or emotional quotient is even more important than your IQ when you're getting to, to the higher levels. And e- EQ is all about emotional, emotional intelligence. It's about understanding yourself and understanding better how your behaviors and actions are being received and perceived by those around you. And at Lope Leadership, we really, really focus on the EQ part, on the emotional intelligence side, and also give skills and behave, you know, up with the behaviors that make people more effective as leaders. But it's really mostly about the emotional intelligence And that's what's really important, especially with artificial intelligence coming down the road for a lot of different industries. Mm -hmm. With artificial intelligence, there's no empathy. There's no, it's 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 just right there in black and white algorithms. Algorithms. So the the need to relate to people is even more important. And that's what emotional intelligence really helps. Can can you go a little further on? I'm just it's something that struck me while while you were answering that question. You know, we had someone on and they said, you know, an important thing to remember is that. Um, managers, people who's a good manager, that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be a great leader. Yep. Um, and, and, and it really strikes me how you're talking about, about empathy. Um, is there, I mean, is that like, are there key components here where if you don't have it, like we can't teach it and that's just it, or mm-hmm. is this something that, you know, there's, there's really just a different, it's just a matter of shifting someone's perspective to, to understand that mm-hmm. leadership isn't about, you know, um, writing up people for showing up late or something like that. <laughs> right. And that's not, that's, that's more like um, performance management, but leadership is inspiring others to follow you. Like I was talking about a little bit earlier. Um, but in terms of, and there was a, a, a wait, question just asked. Can you just repeat that question one more time? or really short. So I, if I had an answer and it slipped out of my head. <laughs> you are um, yeah, well, intelligent. Just, oh, can it be learned? That's what yeah. I wanted to say. Right. So, so here's what's fascinating fascinating about what Gordon was just talking about. First of all, what we find is if if a lawyer or or again the, the senior leader, if they're what we call coachable, if they want to learn, they can. They're going, they're they're always at a, you know, people are at different baselines, if you will, in terms of emotional intelligence, but it is something again proved by research that is learnable if they want to. So for example, I'll give you this one. This is a, and I'll keep it short, but this is a great example. I had a partner come into me and my role in um, this assignment for this firm was to brief, debrief an assessment tool for him. Hmm. He had received some feedback from associates and uh, my job as the coach was to debrief the tool and kind of move through the, re- you know, the, 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 the feedback and what could he take out of that and what could he learn? And when this partner came in, he came in, he closed the door and he said to me, and I know we're not, there's the rule not to curse here, so I won't curse, I'll use another word. But he said, all right, and he waved this document in front of my face and he said, apparently I'm an a-hole. I don't want to be an a-hole, but when they give me crappy work, what am I supposed to do? And he threw the report on the table. So I said, all right. I said, so you don't want to be an a-hole? He said, no. I said, okay, well, first, could you sit down, please? And he did. And he sat down. And I made sure the chair was next to me, not across from me. Because again, from the very beginning, I was trying to set the scene for collaboration. So I said, you don't want to be an a-hole as you described? Nope. I go, so do you always throw work at your associates when um, when it's not what you wanted? He goes, that wasn't throwing. So I picked it up. I threw it back. I go, yeah, it is. 
So he said, well, what am I supposed to do when they give me crappy work? And I picked it up and I said, how about this? And I handed it to him gently. And I said, this is not what I expected. And he said, hmm, I can do that. So I said, okay, good. He goes, but you know what, Natalie? It's not really that I, that. I know I can do that. He goes, but it's the emotions that I'm feeling at the time mm. that makes me want to react. Mm. Well, what he was talking about there was self-regulation. What he was talking about there was emotional intelligence. So that led to a story around when he, his learning was around when he's feeling that emotion of frustration or anger or whatever it is, or disappointment in the associate, he's got to know what it is. And he has to make a conscious choice to respond differently than what he was to not be the a-hole that he told me he didn't want to be when he walked in. <laughs> Man. Yeah. yeah that's, that's, that's something else. Cause you know, it's, it's, it's tough to, you know, separate what someone's saying from from how they're saying it um mm. but it sounds like you kind of got some headway there with that and so to kind of take that further you know getting it to stick like so someone goes to your leadership pr- training or, or goes to a boot camp and they they get inspired they come back with all these new parameters and stuff and and then two weeks later they're you know everything's back to the same and people are throwing papers at each other <laughs> uh, how do you how do you get people to really buy in um, to, to what you're teaching them. So Natalie's going to talk in, in a moment about this, but we um, just came from a conference and, and one of the, the main things was about how to um, make the learning sustainable and, and how to really keep it going, uh, either with coaching touch-ins or with some additional in-house training and develop, development or some e-learning or some you know conference calls, check, check-ins. But it, it really went from the phrase once and done, one and done, to return and learn. And so Lana's going to elaborate a little bit on that. Yeah. So, so in the past, what we've been seeing, not just in our legal clients, this is also in our corporate clients too, but corporate again is a bit of, much further ahead here, um, or further ahead, I should say, in terms of moving towards the return and learn model. So uh, you're right. A lot of times leaders would go to these sort of boot camps or training, um, be very inspired. And I will say that sometimes we've gotten calls from those leaders when they come back and they say, I'm really inspired. This is what I learned. I know that that we can do things differently and how do we help do that? But it really comes down to commitment and accountability, right? So if you want something to stick, you have to be willing to make the continue to commitment to, as Gordon said, return and learn. And that return and learn can look like a lot of different things. It could look like a leader, yes, having some ongoing coaching where they're held accountable for continuing the behaviors that they learned and they're sharing with the coach along the way things that are happening in their day-to-day world and when they are behaving the way they want to or when perhaps they're not because people are human and we slip back into old patterns pretty easily. So it takes time to build new patterns. So often coaching is used for senior level folks and sometimes for emerging leaders too to help them build and be held accountable for the behaviors they say they want to do. So that's one way. Other ways of doing it is, yes, to establish some sort of um, structure or rhythm or, or, or academy, if you will, where people have the opportunity to come back either as groups and have peer groups where they, they, they hold each other accountable. Or often now within law firms, you're seeing more than ever these chief talent officer roles popping up. Mm-hmm. I don't want to say popping up, finally being included in the C level. And these people are overseeing people within the firm where it's their job to help facilitate um, folks either holding themselves accountable or them holding them accountable, whatever they want. But there's no magic wand and there's no magic pill to come back from boot camp and everything changes. It's beautiful if it's the senior leader or one of the managing partners that comes back and says, and this happens, they go to programs that, you know, at, at or, or, or work with a coach, and now they're saying, you know, they've learned something about leadership, they know their behavior matters, and they want that to be part of the culture at the firm. And so they want to be able to spread it or, or create a system for that to happen. I will say I've seen it happen at firms, um, not as often as we'd like to see it happen, but when it does happen and it happens well, it's because there's a commitment there in the leadership to want to make it happen. So that's sort of the answer. I, um, yeah, there's definitely that. the commitment by, by either senior leadership or, or whoever is going, the sponsor of, of what's going on. A lot of times um, firms will, will have accountability partners to keep the, the accountability on, you know, for, for months and, and, and quarters and years to go. Mm-hmm. So 
have put together leadership academies that are sometimes six month academies where there's a, a once a month training and then an, a coaching call in between. Or sometimes we do a, a year long academy. It really depends on what's what the skills are that are being um, introduced. Uh, we come up with different ways of, of trying to make them more sustainable. Really, it goes back to the culture of the firm. You know, what is the culture? Is it a learning culture? Is, is it a culture where if something happens that's not the absolute perfect outcome, is it a learning moment or is it a punishment moment? Speaking like forward facing, like looking looking at the future, um, you're, you're going to need some leaders who have some kind of comfortability uh, with um, maybe business development tactics that are outside of the legal service yeah. industry. So, so you guys say that you Im- incorporate that. Um, do you think that the big challenge for law firms is is coming from the client service side, or is it coming from um, sort of the disruption that they see through legal tech? Or just sort of what do you think are some of the big challenges, uh, you know, you guys see law firms facing, you know, headed into the future leadership wise and also kind of, um, you know, management wise? Yeah, I, I, it's coming from a lot of places. So, right. Technology is, is disrupting everything, right, in terms sure. of how legal work is being uh, performed. And that that's um, and again, as Gordon mentioned, sometimes our, our legal firms are not necessarily known as early adopters of change, but mm-hmm. it's here and it's not, you know, it's not going anywhere. So getting comfortable or or being able to embrace change rather than resist it is certainly important. And again, that's something that's a coachable um, topic. Mm. Um, I think there's certainly, certainly about the workforce, right? As you've heard tremendous amounts around um, the the millennial lawyers or even just the lawyers, um, the way they're working and the environments that they thrive in and the ones they want to be in. Uh, We had a a new, very, very powerful firm that just hired us. And they told us that as they interview their associates and they want top-notch associates and they're willing to pay top-notch pay to get these associates, but the number one question that the associates are asking is what kind of development and coaching will I get? How are you going to stretch me? Yeah. So they want it. And I think, and the firms know that, um, that that's what their lawyers, their lawyers are looking for opportunities to grow, develop expertise. They want to be coached by senior lawyers. Those senior lawyers sometimes are good at coaching. Sometimes they're not. Certainly by the clients, you know, you're hearing some of the um, pressure being put on in terms of who's on my matter, who's on my team. Certainly the, um, the Me Too movement and this whole issue around diversity and inclusion is putting, I don't want to say pressure, but it's making firms rethink or look at and want to elevate their, their, their cultures, if you will. So, so talent is not overlooked mm-hmm. and, and people are given opportunities to rise. And so um, the, a lot of to make that happen requires what Gordon said earlier, a lot of this uh, emotional intelligence skill. You have to flex it. And, and again, I can't tell you how many times we do workshops with lawyers and they're usually short and that's OK. Um, the lawyers? Or- the lawyers. <laughs> I mean, the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> the lawyers will come up to us afterwards and they'll kind of pull us to the side and say, you know what? I need to know more about this. They never taught this to me in law school. Do you have mm-hmm. another book I can read? Yeah. So like I said earlier, they get it. They know it's important. Um, they want to learn. Sometimes we find with lawyers, particularly, they learn best one-on-one rather than in front of groups because there is that um, concern about showing I don't know something. Mm. Um, but uh, more advanced, I will say, or more progressive firms in terms of what have learning cultures do have lawyers learning together. Mm. So you have to meet them where they are. Yeah, yes. well, and, but I think you have to be able to want to hear where they are and ask the questions because I'm I'm just going back to what, you know, when we we're talking about Gordon and how he developed low leadership, it just seemed that there was someone who was asking the questions, figuring out needs assessments, um, but actually having a heart of implementing all of the changes that you guys are suggesting. So it's interesting because there's a lot of dreams but there's a hard core of doing that needs to be um, considered when people are deciding that, you know, I'm going to be a leader. It's great. Let's have some vision, but you have to have some focus. So I'm, I'm just wondering if you, if you guys had to give one piece of advice for law firm owners when it comes to business development, Gordon, I mean, would you say it's, it's that emotional intelligence? Is it something about questioning? Um, I mean, what, what do you think your one piece of advice is? Sure. So, so yeah, I, I would really focus on emotional intelligence because emotional intelligence consists of 
you know, how do you listen to other people? You know, listening is a big part of emotional intelligence if you do it the right way. A lot of us are so busy these days, we're having a conversation, yet we're texting at the same time. So you have to be really present. And that's that's a big part of emotional intelligence is understanding, you know, how to be, you know, in the conversation without, you know, having all these different distractions going on. But it really comes down to relationships with business development. Uh, relationships are going to be more and more important because you're getting so many more things thrown at you. You're going to remember the people that you feel comfortable with. And it's going to be on that that, that human uh, connection, which, which really revolves around that emotional intelligence. So if I can give any kind of uh, advice, again, a lot of attorneys are really, really smart people. A lot of people you know, within the law firms are very, very smart people. But a lot of the times they don't spend enough conscious time on developing their emotional intelligence and, and how they talk to people and how they listen and how they relate and how they establish relationships. A lot of people in law firms are, are, have a very strong preference for introversion. So they have to you know, get out of that mode. Uh, there's a great book called Quiet about how introverts can be very, very successful in the business world. Introvert, Spoken by an introvert. I am an introvert. I'm the introvert. Yes, <laughs> we're, we're very opposite styles. There you go, introvert. So, so by the end of this interview, I'm exhausted because I've I've upped my or flexed my extroversion style. Uh, so I'm exhausted. But Natalie wants to go out and party after yeah. a conversation like I don't this. I want to keep going. Well, <laughs> but you know what's interesting though is is when when they check your passport, they say, "Is this for business or is this for pleasure?" And you think there are no emotions in business decisions. You say, well, I, look, I know I'm sad about this too, but it's just business. We actually say the word business to get rid of emotions. But it's interesting that you're saying to develop business, you need to develop relationships. Relationships are connected through emotional tissue. It just seems odd and at odds with the fact that I'm just going to coldly calculate the way that I grow this firm. But you really actually need to have this soft, <laughs> I don't know, like cocktail party vibe or it, well, it just seems weird that, I mean, you guys are really hitting on something interesting. And I, Sure, sure. So it's, it's not an extreme. So, so you can go to, to various extremes where there's just absolutely no emotion. It's all task related and task focused. It's based on bottom, bottom line numbers and figures. You know, if we need to uh, grow the numbers here uh, or, or increase our bottom line, we're just going to fire those folks over there. That's one <laughs> way of doing it. Right. Um, the other way of doing it is, no, I really care about all these people. I don't care that we're not making it as much profit as we, uh, we want to or need to in order to stay in business. We're just going to keep everybody. So it's the happy medium of you do have to have the technical skills and the business sense to, to make things happen. But you also, we find if you have that, emotional intelligence where it's not, you know, all gushy, total soft, you know, stuff, right? right? It's just, you know, um, that kind of scenario. But but you have the ability to relate better to the people, create an environment where people want to be and want and will thrive and and people want to come and join your firm. Mm. That's really what we're talking about. Gosh. That's so <laughs> awesome. Yeah, go ahead. One thing in terms of emotional intelligence and business development. When someone strengthens their EI, they also become very good at influencing people mm. and influencing decision making. So I know you mentioned the word soft before. I don't really think you know, people do use that word. You may call it a more softer skill, but it's a really powerful skill. Oh, yeah. Um, influence is what we all want to be able to do. You know, as leaders these days, sometimes we have to influence people above us. We have to influence clients that we'd like to. So um, ha being savvy with your EI. Um, helps you to do that um so you know it's it's that's connected so it's you know it, it's all it's all attached to what's happening on our, in our brain actually um you know and being mindful of that and so it's really it's hard work not easy work so, which is yeah. why it's not always easy. one last thing just to to, to highlight that. everyone knows charles darwin came up with the survival of the fittest scenario and, and a lot of people think oh it's the survival of the strongest what he was actually talking about is the survival of the most adaptable. Yeah. The species that are able to adapt to the ever-changing environment that's around them are the ones that are going to continue and survive and thrive. So people that, you know, adaptability is also part of emotional intelligence. How you understand who you are so you can flex in the, in the areas that you need to flex in order to be more successful. <sighs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> All right. Man. Well, that's but that's the that's stuff. I love with it. Oh, that's the stuff. That's the stuff. So um, how can people learn more about Loeb Leadership um, and, and, and you guys over there? Uh, 
couple of ways, I guess. So we certainly have a website, right? Loveleadership.com and it's L-O-E-B, not L-O-V-E, L-O-E-B, leadership.com. Um, we also are on LinkedIn under Love Leadership. We have our Twitter handle. We just started our Instagram. So if people search Love Leadership, we like to have fun. You'll see us having some fun at the conferences and things that we're doing and speaking engagements. Um, I think we have a Facebook page too. So you know, all social media has load leadership. Uh, our, our site again is loadleadership.com. And as Natalie mentioned, it's spelled L-O-E-B leadership. Um, and we do a lot of conferences. We do speaking engagements so people can see us there as well. And, some open and we have a lot of public workshops also around yeah. the country. Yeah. Awesome. We're here to be found, and we love to be found by people that really do care about how they lead, who want to choose to lead as best as they can. And then we love to partner with them and make it happen. Five questions we ask everyone. Question number one, what was the last book you read? Let's start with now. Oh, the last book I read for fun was um, The Tattooist of Auschwitz. Ooh. And the last business book, I, no, it wasn't for fun, but it was a really interesting book. I want yeah. And boy, was that interesting. And uh, I'm reading White Fragility right now, which is fascinating. One of my colleagues who is... Uh, the diversity and inclusion world. Um, she is a black woman. I am a white woman. I thought she was white when I met her. She thought I was black when she met me. Started great <laughs> conversation. We do some inclusion work together now. And she said, hey girl, you got to read White Fragility. So I'm reading that now and it's excellent. Totally. Nice. All right, Gordon. Um, I read and I'm just about this with a Brief History of Humankind uh, by Yuval Noah Harari. And it really takes you back 50,000 plus years ago, uh, when the, the Neanderthals were around, and, and how humans, uh, Homo sapiens, started to realize that the importance of community and communication, and how they, they grew and, and still were able to protect each other and hunt, uh, and how we got to modern day through, through all the different things that, that transpired. I'm fascinated by that kind of a history. Oh, oh, it's, it, can you say, say, say the title again, um, just because sure. it kind of edited, it kind of went faded out. Sure. It's Sapiens, S-A-P-I-E-N-S. It's a, a Brief History of Humankind. It's a good nice. book. Yeah, it's really you cool. Check out. You should check out, there's a, there's a movie called Cave of Forgotten Dreams by Warner yeah. Herzog. Oh, I okay. love that. Dude. Uh, love amazing. that guy. It's all about that, the cave in France with all the paintings. Oh, nice. That's yes. amazing. It's amazing. Yes. Uh, okay, anyway, sorry. Number two, <laughs> what is your favorite place? Gordon. Wow, what is my favorite place? Um, it's a place I haven't been in a long time if we're doing a physical place. Um, when Natalie and I uh, were going on our honeymoon, we went to the Cayman Islands. This was 30 years ago. And we were on a beach. We didn't have children yet. And we were on a beach, a, a kind of a private re- beach. And it, it was just so relaxing, and we had been going through a lot of crazy stuff at that moment in time. So I always said to myself, I'm going to remember this place and this feeling mm-hmm. um, of, of, of calm. Um, and I go back there in my mind every now and then. Nice. Okay. okay. Natalie? For me. Okay, so how would I answer that? Boy, okay. So I, have, I can't say one place. I'm going to start with any favorite place is a place where I am with my kids, particularly now that we're empty nesters. And when I get the opportunity to spend time with them, uh, wherever that may be, that's my favorite place. So I'll say that. Um, other than that, I love my bed because I just <laughs> love to sleep. I'll say that too. Um, and other than that, I, I really love to be, um, I think one of my favorite places to be is actually in the countryside in, in England. Uh, my mother was English. I have a lot of family there. Uh, when we go to the countryside and wherever we're visiting, there's something about it that brings me home, that brings me back to my childhood of wonderful times that were really simple. So I love being there too. Where's the, so, so where's, what's the countryside? Are you talking like Yorkshire? Or- Cheshire. Cheshire. Yeah. Oh, really? It's beautiful. Yeah. Have you been there? Yeah. I been, yeah. No, I did. I went to, we, we had friends that used to live in Leeds. So I okay around there and stuff. So yeah. it's, it's amazing. Nothing we like have family it. in Manchester now and London and Liverpool, but when we visit in Manchester, they take us out to the countryside, like 10 minutes from their home out of the village of Hale. And I just love walking that countryside. Oh, cool. Man, I thought Liverpool was like the coolest city. It I'm is. Like, and I live, I mean, I live in Chicago. So, I mean, I'm yeah. like, I'm a city dude, but oh man. Anyway. Um, yeah. So back to the questions. Number okay. four, <laughs> if, or no, we're on number three. Yeah, come on, man. Don't skip it. Don't skip a question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. I got all I got all flustered thinking about the English <laughs> countryside. Yeah, you're walking. I was pining for the uh, moors. Um, okay. Number three. 
Uh, what sites, blogs, newsletters, or podcasts do you regularly check in with? Oh, Natalie. Good one. Oh, man, wait, hold on. Let me think about that one. What sites? Well, definitely, I, I watch the HBR site a lot. I get the HBR alerts. So I'm very, you know, interested in that. Love that. Um, podcast. I mean, I'm a TEDx fan, that's for sure. Uh, Brene, Br- Brene, Br- Brene, Br- Brene Brown. Mm-hmm. I see I'm Jewish. Okay, <laughs> I check in on her a lot. I like Simon Sinek. I check in on him a lot. S-I-N-E-K. Um, the top of my head those are the ones i can think of okay yeah that's good Go all right uh gordon how about you only one uh lossom yes. <laughs> my man <laughs> we're we're oh, thankful for your fan very good no, I, I i do a lot of the tech talks also um simon sinek uh, uh is a favorite hbr yeah uh, very similar the um the international coaching federation has some great uh, sources and, and uh, materials that we also uh, subscribe to yeah yeah all right. Uh, okay, here we go. Number four. <clears throat> mm-hmm. This is probably the toughest question of the bunch. If you were stranded on a desert island and could only pick one condiment to take with you, what would it be? Gordon. Mayonnaise. <laughs> <laughs> no hesitation there. No hesitation. With, with no joy. Uh, how about you, Natalie? It would be ketchup. Yeah. Ketchup. I can eat mayo by myself. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You guys can get together too. It'll it'll be right. a whole thing. I, it 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 mixes. Um okay, we made it to the end here. Number okay. five. Okay. After a long day or long week at work, how do you relax and unwind? Natalie. Okay. So that as Gordon was saying, um being with people I care about is the way I unwind. Um I love that. So they're definitely, you know, hanging out with some close friends. We don't live too far from the beach. I love to bike ride and go down to the beach and sometimes just sit on a bench and be around the water and, and bring a book. So I would say that. And I will say I also like a good massage or manicure or pedicure. Right yeah. on. Okay, and Gordon. So, so you're going to see there are different styles. And, and by the way, we have been married for 30 years. We're, we've been working full time together for eight years. And the reason why we do it successfully, we believe, is that we actually practice what we preach with emotional intelligence and, and adapting and flexing our different styles. So my style of relaxation or after a long day of work is just to be by myself. Yeah. Um, you know, maybe a glass of wine, uh, maybe a book or maybe a really good show like Game of Thrones um, that uh, I'm into. Um, but I I get more um, relaxation and energy from, from having quiet time uh, versus what Natalie yes. does. Uh, yeah. I've learned to let him be, and he's learned to let me go. Yes. <laughs> For show notes, links, and info, go to thelawsonpodcast.com or follow us on Twitter or Facebook. Be sure to leave us a review and rating in iTunes or wherever you find the you listen to. Until next week, stay lawsome. <laughs>